So a uh, very good morning to you and you're welcome to this uh, webinar which we are hosting at DVB in association with the Ultra HD Forum. My name is Owen O'Sullivan and I am only have the task of welcoming you to this webinar. I'm going to hand over uh, very quickly to Ian Nock who will be our uh, moderator for the webinar. I just want to remind you that the slides and the video will be available on the DVB website shortly after the webinar and uh, tell you that you should use the Q&A interface to ask questions. We will deal with as many as possible in the time we have available. Our aim is to finish up one hour from now uh, at noon European time. But if there are extra questions, uh, we will officially close the webinar, but we'll actually leave it open and we can uh, try to deal with those in a, um, a continued discussion for a little while after the hour is finished. With all of that said, I'm going to invite, um, just to say that you will see all of our speakers uh, during the discussion phase. We will leave the webcams off for the uh, first half of this webinar during the presentations and then they will turn them on uh, during the discussion uh, phase afterwards. So with all of that said, I'm going to invite Ian Nock to share his screen and unmute himself and introduce our webinar, which I hope you enjoy. Good day. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, as I said, my name is Ian Nock, and I'm here to introduce the uh, speakers and presenters today. Uh, I just want to actually uh, bring up uh, a slide just to show uh, an introduction. It's not sharing for some reason. Just need to. We can see you, uh, Ian. Yeah, you just need to go into slideshow mode there. Okay, there we go. Wrong way. Uh, you're in presenter mode at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thanks. All plans go wrong, of course, in the start of the uh, presentation. Um, so, as I said, uh, I'm Ian Nock. I'm uh, the Ultra HD Forum Interop Interoperability Working Group Chair. I also work for Fairmar West, where we provide consulting services to a variety of different clients in the TV and video space. Um, I want to be brief this morning. I just want to tell you a little bit about the Ultra HD Forum um, because that may need a little bit of extra clarity. Uh, the Ultra HD Forum is an industry open forum, which includes content creators, content distributors, and pretty much everybody involved in the entire ecosystem for delivering content. But those, the, these, these, these member companies of the forum are focused on advocating next-gen audio and visual delivery, uh, specifically regarding UHD. Um, you can find out more information about the forum if you wish on the Ultra HD Forum website, uh, which you can see the URL for on the screen mm -hmm. right there. Um, the membership is, as I say, very varied across all areas of the industry and all parts of the ecosystem. Um, but really, as I say, uh, it's got 40 direct members plus, including many organizations uh, as members. Um, and as I say, we are very much focused on all aspects of the ultra high definition technology realms, uh, as you can see here on the screen, which is the, comes from our guidelines definitions. Um, now then, I would like to really hand over to our first presenter, which is um, Jason Power, who will give you a, a DVB focused view on the UHD technologies around today. So. Thank you, Ian. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can you, can you see my slides? Yes, looking good, Jason. Great. All right. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining the webinar. Um, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to give you a very quick introduction to the work that DVB has done on UHD specifications um, uh, and how they're being applied for broadcast and the broadband delivered services. Um, so um, uh, so my, uh, my name is Jason Power, I'm, I work for Dolby um, and I'm speaking today in the capacity as chair of the audio video uh, content group uh, within the commercial module in DVB. So it's our job within DVB to understand the industry's commercial requirements uh, for delivering new kinds of audio video experiences and to help drive uh, input to the technical work uh, that is uh, that, that, that actually defines the specifications. 
Um, a, a quick word on uh, just as, as introduction to DVB. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, with, with DVB already. Um, DVB is a, a global industry alliance of digital media and technology companies, uh, and we exist uh, in order to develop open technical specifications for the delivery of digital TV services, not just by traditional broadcast means, uh, but increasingly also through, through broadband uh, delivered services. And, um, and to give you an idea of kind of the, the, the scale uh, of the organization, we have members uh, right away across the value chain from content creation uh, through, to, through to end devices and, and pretty much every step in between. Um, about 165 members uh, from around the world. Um, and the specifications that we generate, of which there's, there's over 90 today, uh, are used uh, pretty much in every continent and even in every country around the world. And, uh, and particularly to link to today's discussion, we've been working on UHD for, uh, for a long time. Uh, we, we published our first UHD specification back in 2015. Um, and, uh, and as you'll see, DVB specifications are the basis for uh, a large number of the UHD services uh, that, are being, that are being launched today. So what do we mean when we, we talk about UHD? Um, one important thing to remember is there are multiple potential dimensions or elements of the UHD experience. Um, you know, of course, we can have higher resolution or what I've suggested here is more pixels, um, but we can also have better pixels, so uh, high dynamic range or wider color. We can have faster pixels, so we can have images that are refreshed more rapidly, higher frame rates. And we can have better sound. We can have sound that is more immersive and more personalized to the viewer. And our goal at, in DVB is to provide a, a flexible toolkit that can be applied to suit the needs of a particular market or, or opportunity. So to provide a comprehensive and flexible toolkit where you can choose the elements of the experience that you want to deliver. And a good other goal in our work is to make sure that we have specifications that are applicable across a wide variety of different delivery means. So, so yes, traditional broadcast, so you know, cable, satellite, terrestrial, and IPTV, but also the growing world of broadband delivery, uh, both linear services through the new DVBI specifications, and also through our partnership with the HBBTV organization for video on demand. When we think about our work on UHD in DVB, we can think about two main phases of work, um, which, which were completed in March 2015 and, and February 2017. So, uh, so let me put, touch first on, on what we term UHD phase one, uh, which was in 2015. And uh, specifications in, in 2015 introduced the capability to deliver 4K or 2160p images. 10-bit uh, video based on the HEBC main 10 profile, and the possibility also to move to beyond the, uh, the original HD color gamut to a wider color gamut as specified in, in BT 2020. So, uh, so the essentials, you know, the essential core components of a, uh, of a UHD experience. And those phase one specifications enabled the launch of a number of early adopter UHD you know, services, pioneering services. Um, I, I live in the UK, so let me give you a couple of examples from the UK. So, um, you know, in the UK, those specifications were used as a, as a basis for a satellite delivered service by Sky, uh, and also the, the launch of uh, an IPTV delivered service um, by BAT Sport to set top boxes. But as I was saying earlier, UHD can be about more than just more pixels. Uh, so in phase two in 2017, we extended the specification to track some further needs in the market. And what you can see here is we've added the capability to deliver a high dynamic range image using the HLG and PQ technologies to move to higher frame rate 
uh, with support for 100 and 120 hertz based frame rates and to deliver more immersive and personalized audio with, uh, with what's termed next generation audio with, with the AC4 and MPEG-H technologies. Now, just because we have all of those building blocks there doesn't mean they need to all be used, uh, but the specification provides that toolkit so that uh, for a particular service or market opportunity, uh, the, the, the appropriate elements can be chosen to give the, the best experience uh, in that environment. And again, those specifications have been rapidly adopted in the market. Um, some examples. Um, so, 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 so yes, we've seen pay TV you know, uh, embrace these, these new specifications as, as we saw with, with phase one. But we've also seen the start of the generation of terrestrial specifications, so new DVB-T2 based terrestrial platforms uh, that can deliver these new capabilities. For example, the UHD book in Italy and the Nordic UHD specification uh, covering six countries uh, in the Nordic region and, uh, and Ireland. And as well as terrestrial, remember what I was saying about enabling broadband to delivery too. These specifications have also formed the basis for the DVB dash delivered service uh, that is being trialed by the BBC for their UHD version of iPlayer. So it's not just about broadcast delivery, but enabling these new experiences via broadband too. And the work hasn't stopped there. We continue to track the evolution of the market. And in July 2019, we published our most recent update of the specifications, adding the capability for uh, HDR dynamic mapping. Um, so three options for, uh, for, the for the delivery of additional metadata to, uh, to help the high dynamic uh, range experience when using the PQ technology. Um, and the addition of DTS UHD, a third next generation audio format. So I hope what you've seen in that very rapid introduction there is that within DVB, we've aimed to provide a, a very comprehensive, but also a flexible toolkit for delivery of UHD services, you know, that covers all the elements, 4K, HDR, dynamic mapping, wide color, high frame rate, and next generation audio. And with that way you can pick the elements of those that are going to give the kind of experience that, uh, that you want to use. I've also highlighted how DVB specs are in the real world actually powering the deployment of real UHD platforms and services. You'll hear from Ben shortly about the work that the UHD forum has been doing to track the launch of UHD services. And I think you'll see that uh, by far the large majority of those services are based on DVB specifications today. And I've highlighted how DVB specifications are not just about broadcast, but are also enabling a new generation of broadband delivered services. I've added the link there to the DVB website to our specifications page, and uh, please feel, re feel free to reach out with, to me with any questions directly if there's things that we don't cover later in the Q&A. Uh, Ian, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jason. I'd like to now sort of take you across and introduce you to Ben Schwartz, my compatriot uh, from the Ultra HD Forum, uh, as chair of the Ultra HD Forum's Communications Working Group. Ben, take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? Indeed, yes. Oh, good. I automatically unmuted. So, um, uh, I, I chair the communications working group within the forum and as such I'm responsible for our project um, which uh, came up with the service tracker. Uh, I'm going to tell you in my uh, short, if I get my timer working, in my few minutes uh, how, you know, the genesis of the project, how we got there and why we did it. And there's some, some interesting stories there. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a live demo. Um, so I would ask those of you who have been looking at the tracker right now, and I can see some have, if you could uh, refrain from doing so while I'm doing the demo, because although, of course, we can support concurrent users, I don't know if we can, can 
have a hundred using it at the same time. And I'll give you uh, some ideas into the next steps. Um, just to bounce off what Jason said, um, currently, as you'll see, we don't actually publish on the website the specifications, uh, i.e. whether they're DVB compliant specifications for the services or not, simply because we don't quite have enough data there. Um, but I can give you a rough estimate. Uh, Jason is right uh, that the majority of services are DVB compliant. Um, at the moment, we know for a fact that just over 33% of our services tracked are DVB compliant, and we know that about 30% are not. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about that as we go along, but that was just to, to bounce off that. So what is the genesis of the project? Well, um, uh, we've been thinking about this since, since our creation in 2015, um, uh, and as the first services hit the market in 2016. <laughs> It kicked off when uh, our president, Cherry from Harmonic, handed me a list of about 50 services um, saying, hey, Ben, these are the 50 services that we've been tracking. Let's do it in the forum now. So we kind of started thinking about that um, in that time frame. And um, although I've been in and out of sort of marketing roles throughout my life, you must know that any kind of slicing and dicing of a market to try and tell something from it is very tricky and uh, depends uh, the angle you take will change what it is you have to say and we spent a lot of time thinking about what we were going to trap what was the best way of capturing the reality of UHD deployments in the real world so we spent some time uh, with UHD channels um, trying to count them and we ended up uh, at least at the time realizing that that weren't really representative of um, uh, of the actual demand, what was going on on the, on the re reality of the commercial market. They were more representative of the offer and they'd go up and down uh, a bit too fast for us. Um, then we tried considering platforms. Um, again, complicated issue and uh, what constitutes a platform. There's no dictionary definition. Uh, we even went into transport mechanisms so i mean the example of transponders for the satellite business but obviously to do the same it's a variation on the same theme above we had uh, in our work groups we thought about uh, looking into the content that was transported and then you know vod catalogs uh, how, what pr proportion have uhd characteristics which leaves us to the issue which we'll get to and that jason mentioned is you know there are multiple characteristics that define uhd we're going to look at what was 4k and what wasn't what was hdr what wasn't uh, and and the story went on and on and on and uh, what we ended up with is trying to define what is a uhd service that a consumer can buy and when we say buy obviously it means buying through a subscription or through the taxes you pay to your public broadcaster service so so in the end that is what we chose it is uh, commercial consumers facing services uh, because we thought they were the most representative of the customer reality of what's happening in the market um, then came another problem is once we started that the the the, the list that uh, cherry gave me in early 2017 had six fields in the list of 48 services or whatever and uh, we started working away at it and this uh, realized that for example last year um when we'd already published an, an initial version all of a sudden people started complaining to me and saying hey ben you know um what about the HDR services that are still 2K? Um, and, and why can't we capture the fact that NHK is 8K? And so it seems obvious now, but when we started thinking about this in 2015 and 2016, there was no point of, of uh, capturing resolution because at the time, it doesn't make sense today, but at the time, UHD and 4K were almost synonyms, synonyms for most people. And there wasn't such thing as a UHD service out there that wasn't 4K. So that's just one example of how we started with six different fields of data we were capturing to the current level of 21 fields. Um, and uh, I just want to talk about one of the most complex fields to capture, which was what we're calling subscriber reach. Uh, which is basically the number of subscribers, you know, what's the subscriber base? And we were a little bit naive, um, thought, well, we'll just capture, you know, the, the, the base, you know, Sky, to give an example, in the UK, publish their total, you know, number of subscribers, so, so it'll be easy. Uh, but it wasn't. 
and we spent a lot of time and got kind of stuck. And Paul, who's going to talk later, he actually sent us a lot of boy and, 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 and gave us some data that enabled us to make a, a educated guess of how you work, go from a general subscriber base to a UHD subscriber base. Uh, and so that was just to give you some ideas of the genesis. I'm now going to try and launch the, the service live. So, I mean, the reason we relaunched it just a month ago is we're really celebrating basically a tripling of the services from 2018 as we see them uh to so in in three years so three years to triple that's that's good we'll see what the next three years will hold um the data that i'm showing you is captured from three billion different subscriptions and I sorry owen here yes. in the project office have you shared your screen or just your powerpoint show my screen we're still seeing your powerpoint slide at the moment yeah yeah okay oh, i'm okay. just about to launch it Sorry, I'm just about on. to launch it because I had these three lines data from yep. 3 billion subscriptions. And uh, today this data represents 300 million UHD subscriptions. And so now we shall see if it works. And now you can see I'm really, really live. It took a bit of time to load. So now is the time when I ask you, please don't use the service tracker right now. Those of you listening, <laughs> they will stay responsive. This, this is what it looks. So you can see uh, we just went down from 148 to 146 services. Um, it just minor updates. Uh, three quarters are linear services. One quarter are VOD based services. Uh, almost half now have HDR and almost a quarter have um, early versions of next generation audio. We'll talk about that in a second. So if you see it by default, it opens on the B2C, the consumer facing services, which is our main table. You can see here, this is where there's the 140 odd services. I should go up a bit more slowly. I don't know how, how good Zoom is at doing that. Uh, by default, it's, it's, it's um, sorted by operator. You can sort by market, uh, backwards, forwards. You can do any kind of sort, sorting by kind of service. I'm not gonna talk through all of it. That would take too long just to give you an idea. Um, as I said, under the hood, we have quite a few more fields that we're not displaying yet. We'll display in future versions because the data isn't quite reliable. About. So typically, whether they're DVB or not, that's what I explained. Uh, as I said, just over 50% are DVB compliant, and we will have that information there soon. Currently, you can do some pretty nifty uh, searching. So if you're looking for, for example, what network delivery systems, and you're only interested in satellite, you click there, you say, okay, and here we have exclusively satellite versions um, and you can if you want to know within those satellite versions I'm only interested in HLG that would be a bit smaller and you can gradually go up and down and it's quite an intelligent sophisticated uh, version now we can see that we only have 4k services there um, one other thing I wanted to say in this quick demo is uh, we do have a few other tables. So they're much smaller, but we do have a, a representative list of B2B channels because these are things we felt we did have to capture, but they didn't, that they're not uh, services that a subscriber can subscribe to, which was our definition. Um, so that's one other table. And there's also a table here for event-based and demo services, which we intend to extend. Currently it's very short, but it will, it, it will be extended. Um, and there's a little summary here, and this is something that's going to be vastly enhanced. So this is actually quite exciting when you spend the time to think about what it actually means. You have in the consumer space, the next generation audio subscriber reach uh, versus the number of operators. So you can see that, you know, um, although 80% uh, of operators don't have NGA, uh, only half uh, the subscribers do. What that basically means is that the larger operators support NGA. Um, and the same way with HDR, you, you, you can work out quite a lot of interesting information. So this is giving a, a little hint at what's under the hood, but obviously the real, the real stuff is reserved for our our subscribers and I have one last slide and I'm just about out of time so I can quickly say so it's next steps those charts you saw I want to make them dynamic um, we want uh, dedicated feedback forms we want more information there there is an issue there at the moment um, I am um, a mayor culpa I wasn't clear what next generation audio actually meant when we kicked this off so that has to be clarified there's a little bit of work there. Um, there's also a little bit of clarification to be done. If you go through the table, sometimes you'll see multiple lines for the same operators. Other time there's a huge operator like say Netflix and there's just one line for them. Um, so, so that 
is is almost done that work, but there's a little bit of tidying up there. There's also an issue when there's multiple HDR and multiple next generation audio technologies, and there's also a lot of legitimate commercial sensitivity that you know uh, Adobe or Nextberry will want their names in the right place at the right time, and we have to make sure that we're both fair uh, and legitimate there. We want to finish the um, the capture of um, uh, as I said, the, the DVB based specification or not. Um, there's another interesting idea. It's going to be a bit complicated. We're going to try and consider a metric to capture the proportion of UHD because at the moment it's a little bit unfair to have some small service in one country that has one carousel with a little bit of 4K content, you know, looping on a, on a 40 minute loop and that's it. And that clarifies as a UHD service. And you compare that to another service that has thousands of hours of VOD and five or six channels. Um, and the final thing is that at the moment, uh, users get ac uh, members of the forum get access to an Excel spreadsheet. It's a little bit ugly, uh, so I want to make that more beautiful and even create a members view online where you log in as a member, you'll get access to all the data. And um, I'm sorry for having been one minute over, but I'll hand over back to you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I'd like to actually maybe ask those people who are watching the webinar to uh, uh, get their head out of the actual uh, tracker now and come back to our webinar here so you can hear the next presenter. Uh, our next presenter is actually Paul Gray. Uh, Paul, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much indeed. Just to share my screen. Okay. So hopefully you can see that. So good morning, my name is Paul Gray. I'm research director at uh, Informatech Omdia. Um, it's probably a name you're not familiar with. So Omdia bought the IHS uh, display research business as part of uh, a whole load of its other tech analyst uh, services that, uh, that it bought. And before that, uh, it was a company called Display Search. So I've worked through those businesses with different names for the past 12 years. And I lead our research on television sets uh, business worldwide. If we look at what's going on in terms of UHD TV shipments, then about 60% of TVs that are sold today have UHD resolutions. Um, you can see the regional differences here that uh, early on, it was really driven by China, and in the last couple of um, years, then North America and Western Europe have caught up very dramatically. And that's been really driven by two things. So first of all, TV product ranges changed from uh, HD resolutions to UHD resolutions. And nowadays, if you buy a TV of 50 inches or bigger, then it's pretty much impossible to find one uh, that is, isn't in UHD resolutions. And the other thing that's underlying it, of course, is that uh, consumers buy bigger and bigger TVs every year, um, underpinned by the LCD panel industry that continues to uh, commission new LCD panel fabs that can make larger and larger screen sizes economically. And that's a, a trend that's been going on for 15 years or so that essentially is a rule of thumb, people buy a TV uh, each year on average that's an inch bigger than the year before. Um, and at the moment, that is a trend that shows little sign of slowing down. Um, although indeed, of course, we will hit, hit finite uh, constraints in the end, which is how big people's living rooms are and what size of screen they will tolerate rather than necessarily what size of screen they can afford. Um, just I'll call out a couple of ones, which is uh, for a long time, China was uh, buying the largest TV sizes in the world. In the last two years, that's really slowed down. Um, China is very much two markets. So one of uh, the uh, more developed urban areas, especially coastal China, and then there is a hinterland of uh, rural households who are really buying TVs that are very, very functional um, and much smaller. And the other puzzle on all this is Japan, which despite people having um, high incomes and high living standards, people buy quite small TVs. Um, and Japanese consumers have been very, very resistant to buying much larger TVs. And 
uh, in general, Japanese consumers buy the smallest TVs in the world, um, even compared to consumers in countries like, say, Indonesia. So there are some puzzles there as to exactly why that is, but it's, it's clearly consumer preference. Um, if we then look at our UHD TV shipment forecast, then uh, obviously the elephant in the room this year is coronavirus. And especially this quarter that when we're in now, then certainly the effects of lockdown mean that the TV market um, in many countries is down between 20 and 40%. Um, there are some puzzles. So we've seen as lockdown happens or just before, then consumers uh, in, in many markets actually surge and buy a lot of TVs. Um, I think that what we're really in there is the electric babysitter market. So um, they buy supplementary TVs for kids' bedrooms or indeed to use as monitors. Um, what is, uh, if you like, comforting for the UHD TV side is that actually um, we don't see the market shrinking for UHD TVs this year. It's certainly lower than we'd expected. So um, our forecast before coronavirus was about um, 10 million higher, but that ongoing increase in screen size is, uh, is underpinning the UHD TV forecast and that we see it at about 120 million this year, um, growing to something like 150 million a year thereafter. And the overall TV market is barely growing in, in most regions. Um, and we had seen a macro trend that the number of TVs per household was actually going down as people used um, tablets and smartphones for personal viewing. If we look at UHD household share, um, so how many households have at least one UHD TV in them, then that's very much led by North America where TVs are replaced very often relative to countries like, for example, China, which has quite a small TV market considering the number of households. Um, and so North America and then Western Europe convert rather more rapidly uh, than China did. Um, Western Europe does trail North America, and the reason for that is that we still buy smaller screen sizes, and there are many consumers and many households in Western Europe that are very happy buying a 32-inch TV um, with HD resolution, and that completely fulfills their needs for what they want. They don't have many great expectations for anything much larger, and in fact, they don't really want a much larger TV. Um, they're fairly disengaged consumers. And then in um, developing regions, in particular Asia Pacific um, and Middle East and Africa, we see much lower uptake, which is that people buy much smaller TVs because that's uh, what they can afford. So affordability is a very, very critical part for emerging regions uh, as to what TV they buy. If we then move on, this is a slightly different view that um, that I'm presenting to Ben, which is we count the number of unique linear channels. As Ben uh, said, it's very hard to be fair on all these um, ones. If you have one service that has a 40 minute loop in UHD, that would count as a UHD service. So what we're, we're doing is counting the number of unique channels where if you turn the sound off, um, you, would, you would be able to see whether that was different to other ones uh, by region. And that really is a measure of the diversity of offering uh, of what's available. Um, and what you can see is that um, despite slightly lower uh, uptake of UHD households in, in, in Europe, then actually uh, the channel diversity is quite high. We have to remember, of course, in Western Europe that uh, many channels are uh, unavailable in, in different countries because of, uh, of language and copyright reasons. Uh, but even so, in Europe, the, the, the demand uh, is, be is being met already for, for UHD content. And the one to really notice uh, as an exception is China, where there's actually very little UHD content available, even if the market is um, extremely enthusiastic for new technologies and UHD TVs. Um, one other one to, to call out on this is Asia Pacific, where despite relatively low uptake of UHD TVs, because consumers want or can afford only smaller TVs. Um, actually, India um, is already leading um, 
the charge in terms of UHD in the region. Um, and that Indian satellite services in UHD um, really has a lot more content diversity than you'd expect. Likewise, in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of UHD available in Russia. So something like nine or 10 channels are available across Russia. Um, so don't uh, assume that just because countries are less wealthy that they actually have uh, less channel offerings available. Uh, and, and in particular, if you notice North America, again, is an exception where TV providers in North America have been looking for very, very convincing and concrete business cases for launching UHD channels um, and have been far more cautious than, uh, than people in other regions. Uh, that is about, uh, about my 10 minutes. So um, uh, over back to you, Owen and, uh, and, and Ian. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, I'd like then we're going to move into the uh, uh, question start of uh, questioning side of the webinar. Um, now you can actually see me physically. Uh, what I would like to do though is uh, also introduce uh, uh, Virginie, who from uh, also from DVB is the chair of the technical module AVC group, who I'd like to maybe address a, a first sort of technical question, really based upon the most recent work that the technical module has been involved in uh, around dynamic mapping. Considering it's based upon technologies that originally were commercial uh, proprietary technologies, which then became standardized and then much more commercially developed. And now you're, uh, you've included them within the, uh, the latest variants versions of TR101154. So maybe you can talk to the challenges of doing that. Thank you, Jan. Um, yes, yeah, so first maybe a small explanation of what dynamic mapping is. It's a set of metadata that you can send uh, on a picture basis that basically contains some characteristics about the content that enables you uh, at the receiver to post-process the content to adapt it to the characteristics of the display, which, are, which can of course vary widely in the field. Um, now, DVB is a transmission standard, so what's ha what happens in the receiver is not really something we care about. Uh, what we had to standardize is what kind of information we send and how we send it. And uh, as you say, these technologies were developed commercially first. Uh, there was no reason to reinvent the wheel, basically. So what we did was uh, reference um, standards that I had already done that uh, in Etsy and CTA, for example, to reference their syntax and uh, their, the information that they were sending um, so that basically uh, the DVB signals can be understood by receivers in the market. Um, and um, th that's basically what we did for the uh, dynamic mapping part. Uh, of course, we keep an eye on what's happening in the market so that uh, DVB standards uh, can address uh, all the receivers as much as possible. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so I'd like to now sort of draw some questions in from the audience. Um, I have a, an, a question here regard from Johannes Heckman regarding the UHD service tracker uh, interface. Um, Basically, were any EAC JOC services included as Atmos, or was it AC4 only? And I think you drew attention to that actually in your presentation, but if you'd like to give a, a more concrete, uh, deeper answer to Ben. Yeah well, yeah, well, first of all, to say I'm sorry, I apologize, because a part of the issue is my personal fault. Uh, I'm not a specialist in audio, and when we dived into this two or three years ago, I got a bit mixed up. And so currently the service trackers idea of what they call, what we called NGA um, was a mix between immersive audio on the one hand and codex on the other hand. But these are two adjacent concepts, but it's a different concept. You use a codec to do various things, an audio codec, and you can use a specialized audio codec like AC4 to deliver immersive content. And what we called NGA, was basically, we didn't really think about it carefully. And so I, we ended up tracking anything where commercially, from a marketing perspective, the operator used the word DTSX or used the word Atmos or used the word MPH, and we didn't think about it more. And this must be clarified. It is an issue with the tracker and it will be fixed very soon. And probably we'll end up having a separate column, one column for does, do we support immersive audio or not? And a second one for what codec, audio codec is used. Um, I hope that answers the question. Excellent, excellent. 
Um, then I'd like to then, uh, there's another question come here from the audience, from Evelina Simone. Uh, what is the best, most optimal UHD format codec to use in the edit suite so that we have a good enough quality material whilst broadcasters are still working out what is the best delivery format for them to receive? And I'd like to address that to Virginie. Okay, so uh, DGB doesn't really uh, do anything in the, um, uh, in the suite. Basically, we, we define the transmission format. So I'm not sure what the best coding format for the broadcasters in, uh, in-house is, but uh, certainly in terms of delivery uh, for UHD, we only considered HEVC. So if you want to make your life easier, it seems it's best to use HEVC, then you can just use that uh, for delivery as well. Okay. Um, the, the only thing I'll probably add to that, I think maybe there's an, there's an inferment of uh, the format of HDR maybe, because there has actually been an active discussion for many years now about what is the best HDR format. But I think uh, the, from the forum perspective, just to add, and I'm sure DVB has their own view, the you know HDR format is a little bit of a red herring. There are many formats of HDR which are utilized for production and delivery to the consumer in terms of what's actually used directly to the consumer in distribution. That is very much depends upon the pros, the pros and cons as the broadcaster or operator of the platform sees and both formats are equally valid for most scenarios. So it, it's all down to choices uh, about what is good and what is better. Yes, certainly in terms of HLG and PQ, uh, DVB supports both. And I know that uh, many uh, receivers in the meantime also support both. So it's very much uh, a decision for the broadcasters to make. Okay. The uh, next question actually I've got up is uh, from uh, Tommy Flanagan. Um, and this is actually in the last webinar, it was mentioned that UHD service launches would inevitably stall, but a post pandemic recovery was not a matter of if, but when. Has the new service tracker research projected a time frame for this recovery? And maybe uh, both Ben and Paul can maybe uh, comment on this. I can dive maybe in first. Jason, actually. <laughs> yeah, anybody, but... Uh, uh, I think the, uh, if any of us are being honest, we don't really know yet. Um, you know, the, the, the pandemic is, is still is still happening. Um, there are a few elements that are clear. One thing that we didn't talk about, uh, Tommy, last time is that we didn't realize that we thought, hey, isn't this wonderful that the network seems to be supporting all this huge extra load? And since uh, it's tweaked on a few of other people, and now I've realized too, that uh, live sports disappeared. <laughs> And at the same time, we had this huge uh, surge in on-demand consumption, live vanished. So if we gradually come out of the pandemic and sports comes back, there, there, there could be an issue there that could be quite interesting. The other thing to answer more specifically Tommy's question, um, the research I do, and one thing I'm finding with the service tracker is any kind of noise, anything that's happening in the market, we come up with new guidelines, DVB do whatever, something big happens. The result that we measure in our service tracker, which is commercial facing things, is at least 12 months later. So whatever the pandemic is gonna to do to UHD service launches, I'm sure I'm gonna see it in the service tracker, but I don't think I'll see it till sometime in 2021. Okay. And Paul, what about your thoughts, particularly from the display end, because this is all part of an end-to-end -end delivery, of course. Yeah, certainly. Um, one of the, the things that, that I, I would say that we know is that in developed countries, then the TV market is pretty much independent of the economy. Um, and, and there are very good reasons for that. The main one being that consumers have choices and if they're economizing, they may not go out in the evening, they may not go to a cinema or a show or go out for dinner, and TV is cheap entertainment. Um, at the moment, we see an incredible surge in the TV market in the United States, but remember that a 32-inch TV costs less than two tanks of fuel. So you may be locked down, you may not be going out, but actually you've got cash in your pocket. Um, so in that respect, TV is quite recession-proof. And we may see people stay at home more and the relative value of TV and TV services goes up to those consumers, um, which is a positive note. I think the other one that we have to consider is the, the general effects of recession. Um, 
and investment money being much scarcer and that I don't think that we will in future have the, the vast amounts of money that have been splashed towards content creation um, and services uh, in the hope of a sort of field of dreams, build it and they will come business model, people will look for quicker returns. So we will probably have relatively less content available in future, but that doesn't mean to say necessarily that people will, uh, will watch less UHD. But undoubtedly recessions bring consolidation events throughout many, many industries. Um, and in the words of Warren Buffett, the people who've been swimming with no shorts get discovered when the water goes down. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, Jason, do you have anything to add on that from the sort of commercial side of things? Uh, I, I would just say that obviously, you know, for the launch of, of services, uh, then live sport has been so far a massive driver and, and clearly there's been some significant disruption this year. Um, you know, so certainly we're aware uh, within Dolby of, of, of broadcaster launch plans that have been significantly affected by, uh, by the postponement or cancellation of major sporting events this year. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, but I think we, we have some big events next year uh, to look forward to, you know, big sporting events rescheduled um, live sports uh, now, you know, cautiously restarting in some in some places, um, and so um, uh, yeah, and so I you know I, I think it would be a mistake for for any of us to to try and forecast in the current uh, the current environment. Um, it, we're we're all living through a uh, unprecedented level of unpredictability, um, but I think we're you know with we're, we're confident that. Um, that those the, the drivers you know will stay that will ultimately in the long term stay that stay the same. Okay, that's good, excellent. Um, the next question we've got up actually is from Ravi Saxena. Forgive the pronunciation if that. Um, and there's a very clear technical question here regarding average bit rates on satellite for 4K delivery uh, and which DVB standard is to use. And I'd like to address this to Virginie. Sorry, uh, I think I missed the question. Is this the first question on the? Uh, it's a oh, what's what the average, the average bit rate? Bit rate? Yes. Right. Um, so the average bitrate will, of course, depend on uh, the systems that are used. I cannot really answer this question because you can have all kinds of uh, possible bitrates depending on the encoders that you have, uh, how good are they, how, how much, uh, how good the quality you want. So that's, that's really something that uh, the, the codex can can support, they, they can support lower bit rates, higher bit rates, depending on how much time to ha you have also to encode your content. If it's live, the bit rate will of course be higher than uh, if, if you have more time to encode the content. So that's a question that's really difficult to answer. Uh, as for which DVB standard is used, DVB-S2 or DVB-S2X, uh, again, uh, both are available uh, from DVB perspective, uh, depends on uh, what your requirements are as a, as a broadcaster. Okay, and just, just to extend your answer maybe a little bit, we have an additional question here from Ravi Saxena about the average bit rate for 8K. Uh, maybe just to maybe give that a little bit of clarity, although for, for many of us, 8K is very much in the future rather than reality today. Right. Um, again, that's the same thing. Um, we, we don't have 8K in, uh, in DVB yet, uh, but uh, HVC is certainly capable of supporting 8K. Um, yeah, th th that's the same thing as for 4K. It depends how much quality you want. So, of course, if you're going to send 8K, you will probably want to increase your bit rate. You send more bits, you're, you send more pixels, you want to have good quality pixels. Um, otherwise, there's no point. You can just reduce your resolution. Um, but it really depends on what kind of requirements you have, what kind of service you want to show. And um, the codex themselves can support a, a really wide range of bit rates. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and then I've got a question here from Riyad Najm. 
Uh, is there a guidelines document that can help less developed broadcasters introduce UHD services in the value chain, depending upon the affordability and specific needs of the consumers? Uh, to be honest, I think, uh, Ben, I think you can answer that one very easily and quickly. I could as well, but let you do it. You're muted. You're muted, Ben. Sorry. Uh, not only is there a, a guidelines that we publish, but that there are other ones too, but uh, we're very proud that we moved our guidelines from, we had a phased approach too, and specifically targeting the smaller operators who don't have research engineers who are thinking about all these things. They just have the operational guys. Um, and when there's a phased approach, phase one, A, B, C, whatever, that kind of scares them. So we've simplified it and we have this concept of foundation technologies and enhancement technologies. So for the smaller operators who don't want to take any risk, they only want really bulletproof uh, technologies that are easy to implement, they can just implement what is in the guidelines called foundation technologies. And you can find all of that on the Ultra HD Forum website slash guidelines. Excellent. Excellent. Um, the next one that I'd like to address then is for, from Tommy Flanagan again. Um, following the recent delivery of MPEG's EVC and endorsement from CE makers, how do we see LCEVC in part two accelerating UHD streaming services? I think, Jason, I think this is a, a question for you, I believe. Yeah, so it's an interesting time in, in video coding. Um, we have a saying in the, in the UK that um, you wait forever for a London bus and then three of them come along at once. Um, and it feels like we're delivering through that moment with video, video codecs and that we're actually, we have a whole, whole new generation of video coding solutions uh, uh, coming to fruition. Uh, so so it, it, even within the MPEG organization, there are multiple different uh, technologies being now finalized. Uh, VVC or versatile video coding, uh, EVC um, and, uh, and LC EVC, um, and also other organizations uh, bringing, uh, bringing uh, solutions forward. So, so we're not short of new coding options. Um, Within, within DVB, uh, what we have in the specifications today, what the, with our members have seen a market need to, to include is, is HEVC. Um, so you know, we're, we're starting to, to, to try and understand what the market might need from a next generation video, video coding solution within the, the kind of standardized framework that the DVB provides. Um, but, but right now, what, uh, what, what is in the specifications is, is HEVC. And that obviously, uh, I'd like to maybe, there's another question from Ravi Saxena regarding what the most popular codecs for 4K and 8K. And I think your answer maybe draws that to, towards it's HEVC really is currently the most popular. Is that correct? Yeah, so HEVC is being used for the, uh, for the uh, 4K services. Um, uh, certainly, that's the, that's, that's, that's the sole codec that's in our, in our 4K profiles today. Okay. Uh, I may be able to expand also on that question. Um, yeah. You should be careful that uh, AVC, EVC, and the LC EVC are two complete, two completely different codecs, and uh, LC EVC is also quite different from VVC or EVC because this is something that uh, provides an additional level of enhancement on existing codecs. So you have a base layer that actually uses existing codecs and doesn't have to be EVC. Uh, it could be HEVC, it could even be H.264. So uh, this is something that can be put on top of what's existing. Uh, as Jason said, at the, at the moment, we don't have anything in the DVB specification using these codecs because they are not completely finalized anyway. Uh, we're looking at them, of course. But uh, this LC EVC could really uh, be used independently from, uh, from EVC. And I, I'm not sure it's very clear from the question. Okay. Okay. And what about, this is a question from Uray Alpha Gamer. Um, what about AV1 and the usage of AV1 in a IPTV and OTD distribution? How does that sort of fit into the picture of today from your perspective, Virginie and Jason? Maybe I could start. Um, so, uh, so obviously we're, um, we're aware that AV1 is, is being used in the internet, um, in, in the broadband streaming delivery um, market. Um, you know, my understanding is that it's it's utilized today 
primarily for uh, nonlinear video on demand um, um, and, uh, and and streaming applications. Um, uh, you know, again, it's uh, it's a technology that within DVB, you know, we and our members are, are, are staying aware of, um, but it's it's not something that uh, that DVB members have brought forward for inclusion in the DVB specifications at this point. So, so with my DVB hat on, it's it's it, it's not something that we've actively worked on. Okay. Virginia, do you have anything to add? And um, I have a separate question from Terence Smith on the same vein regarding AV1 and the support for 4K. Maybe you can include that in your answer. Right. So, um, yeah, as Jason said, we don't have AV1 currently in the DVB specification. It's, of course, being looked at together with the other um, uh, alternatives that we discussed just before, EVC, LC, EVC, DV, uh, DVC. Uh, at the moment, uh, all these codecs are, uh, well, AV1 has been uh, already uh, released. Uh, the other ones are really new. Uh, we have first to evaluate um, how each of them could potentially be used for uh, DVB applications, how, which kind of formats. It's really difficult to answer these questions because at the moment we do not know. We are looking at all of that from DVB's perspective. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I have one question from my little roster here, actually, and this one actually I'd like to address to Paul. Um, historically, displays have driven the content, so displays more or less came first in many respects. Are we finally seeing any turnaround that uh, that uh, content starts driving the display requirement? Um, I, I think I think there's an interesting question, which is what uh, what starts it off and what adds value. So. Obviously, 30 years ago, broadcasters broadcast into thin air and waited for the TV sets to appear. Um, and in that kind of world, then standards were, were set before the TV set shipped. Um, since then, hyper competition in the display and TV industry have, have meant that we've had the hardware appear before the content. Uh, while the industry continues to do that, we see 4K um, uh, came out long really before services and everybody rushed to produce services and now of course 8K TVs are, uh, are becoming available from several brands. Um, at the same time, if you're a consumer, then in the end you look through the TV, you don't look at it. Um, and, and what matters is the content. So while these uh, different formats appear, it relies on content to actually give them value. Um, it's a bit like wash, buying a washing machine, but not having any soap to put in it. Um, and therefore, for, for lasting value in the TV, you have to have the content that matches it. And a thriving content ecosystem is what TV is all about in the end. Um, and you can see markets where, for example, HD has been scarce, like Germany, that actually consumers there spend less on TVs than they do in markets that have thriving choice of HD. Um, it's still a cost option to have HD in Germany from some pay TV providers. Um, and the rest of the SD is very heavily compressed. And as a result, German consumers in particular don't buy particularly high spec TVs. Okay. Ian, so uh, uh, sorry, it's Owen in the project office here. Just as we approach uh, midday in, in uh, Central Europe, I want to just say, as people will start to drop off the uh, webinar now, probably with other appointments, that the slides are available at dvb.org slash webinars, and the video of this, including the discussion, will be made available later on today. So if people do need to go away now, you can catch up with this discussion later. I think all of our speakers are happy to stick around for a little while and try to get through as many of these questions as we can. So I'll hand back to you now, Ian. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, in that case, then, what I would like to do, actually, there's a couple of questions that have come up around HFR uh, from Sabino Mantovano. Uh, do you think HFR will, white, will be widespread in the near future, despite difficulties in production environments, etc.? And also the other HFR-related question um, is uh, where are we with HFR? There have been a number of trials, but there seems to be no appetite to deploy services. So maybe Jason, you can uh, talk to that in terms of uh, that part of the ecosystem. And also maybe just touch on what is really HFR. 
Yeah, so um, so let me start with the, the second bit first. So um, so so what is HFR? So um, uh, HFR is essentially sending more images per second, um, and it enables us to give a, uh, a an image that uh, uh, portrays motion um, uh, more realistically, more smoothly. Um, so I think you know those of us who have been to industry trade shows and the like, you know, back, re re remember those days, um, uh, you know, we'll have seen some very compelling demonstrations of, of, of high, high frame rate and what it can add to, um, to, uh, to content like sport. Um, you know, I myself was, uh, was at a trial uh, that the EBU did at the Berlin Athletics, the European Athletics Championship um, back a, a, a couple of summers ago. Um, which was a hundred hertz production and uh, and and produced some absolutely um, stunning images and 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 some amazing next generation audio to go with it. Um, so 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 you know, the high frame rate images can 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 look fantastic. Um, you know, as I think that was highlighted in one of the questions, uh, the challenge with with HFR is is mostly on the on the content acquisition side. Um, it is. Um, it's there is some some complexity to to, to shoot, produce, um, and deal with the content through the infrastructure prior prior to delivery. Um, but you know, we we at DVB have felt it was an important component of, uh, of 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 the toolkit to provide a full and comprehensive set of set of tools for um, for broadcasters and operators to choose from as as they as they plan their services. Um, one aspect that we have ensured in the, in the specifications is that the very clear commercial requirement was that we should support a backwards compatible mode of delivering high frame rate services. Um, so, um, so what I mean by that is, is the ability to, uh, to transmit high frame rate services in a manner that will be compatible with non-high frame rate receivers. So for those market scenarios where, uh, where there are already TVs uh, deployed in the market or uh, set of boxes that are deployed in the market uh, that are non-high frame rate, um, the services can be received on those and will give you a, a regular um, 50 hertz image. Uh, but if you have a high frame rate equipped receiver you know, now or in the future, then, uh, then you would be able to you know, get the full, the full capability. Um, so, so, so I think uh, I think that you know the, chal the 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 challenges are not so much on the on the receiver side, um, although Paul or, or Virginie may may have more comments on on that on that side, but but more on on the production side. Um, as a final note, I, I think there have been several uh, reports in the industry that have, have have linked high frame rate as as an important component um, should. Uh, the the resolution of the image ever be increased in the future you know to 8k or beyond um, and i have a suspicion that the high frame rate debate will be reignited by by any future discussion of uh, of also higher resolutions uh, virginie do you want to add any comments um yeah so I, I agree with you from a technical perspective high frame rate was uh, originally uh, developed together with 8k not with 4k because they notice that especially if you have lots of pixels uh, you want to send um, pixels more often the motion is simply better with hfr with 8k um, I think what you said before is also very important because I believe the question hinted that HFR doesn't bring uh, a particularly uh, remarkable uh, quality improvement. I think it depends very much on the content. Uh, as you were saying before, the whole point of HFR is to send more pictures per second. So it's only interesting for content with a high motion. If you have two people speaking in a room, of course, you're not going to gain anything from HFR. So uh, it's mostly interesting for sport. And I do believe that HFR will come, but only for some particular content. It's obviously completely useless for uh, other kind of content. And for this kind of content, no, I don't believe it will ever come. It will really come for content that has high motion. That's where you see a really uh, relevant quality improvement. Okay. I would like to add on that because the forum has been involved in a number of uh, interoperability 
uh, verifications and testing and also demonstrations at industry events like NAB in 2019 or IBC in 2019, where we showed uh, HFR content and showed the the, the inc inc incredible improvement in the quality, the perception of quality that it can bring. But I would like to reaffirm, as Virginia said, that it very much depends upon the content. If you've got very static content, it's barely noticeable. If you've got high motion content, the, it provides uh, an improvement or a an inc significant increase in the perception of resolution without actually adding any new pixels. It's just adding, obviously, the, the more frames, basically. So um, can I just say quickly one thing? Um, first of all, the UHD forum starts standard frame rate at 50 or 60 frames per second. That may not be clear for everybody. Um, so some yeah. people think that 50 or 60 is already high frame rate. If that's your case, well, then we already have high frame rate. Um, so, so in our case, we define it very clearly as starting at 100 frames per yes. second. I just wanted to point out there in the comments, uh, it's now vanished because we've answered it, but David Mercer from Strategy Analytics pointed to an interesting piece he just published, and there was another really interesting piece by Yuri Gertzkins in Flat Panels HD. So I don't know why, but it's a subject that's coming up a lot again now. It's been dormant for, for a short while. And if I could just give my two pence worth on the on the fact that sometimes it can be disappointing, the demos, when you come and see this demo, oh, high frame rate, and what can I see? One of the reasons um, I'm convinced personally that, that, that sometimes it takes a bit of time is that the brain, human brain, from all the things, when there's missing information, which is temporal, we're actually very good at filling in the gaps. And I, do you remember, Ian, our very early demo back in 2016 or 17, which was ice hockey, and we saw the putt, uh, the puck sort of uh, on one version. And when you saw the standard frame rate version first, you say, okay, that looks okay. And you saw the high frame rate version afterwards. You say, okay, that looks okay. It was quite hard. And then you, you know, you said to me, no, but look, Ben. And then you showed me the slow version and said, look, you can actually see the puck here on the screen. And then it disappears and appears here. And I would look for that. And, oh my God, you're right. But when yeah. I first saw it, I didn't actually see it because my brain is so used to crappy frame rates. I'm sorry for my French, but um, that uh, the, the, the brain makes up for it. And I think that it's one of those uh, enhancements where we need to educate the population, but the public, and when they get educated, high frame rate will be something that will be highly desirable yeah. when people get used to it. I would like to mention that the high frame rate version of that content, the hockey puck was visible on screen at all times in every frame. It didn't suffer from the disappearing puck problem, which for those persons in the US who are really big and into uh, ice hockey, they were like, wow, I can actually keep, because that's where they're looking. That's, that, that's what they're looking at is where is the puck? And the moment on standard frame rate content, they, they're pretty much guessing sometimes where the puck is based on where the position of the players are. But with HFR in that instance, you saw the puck always, it was always visible. You were following it around the screen. And I can see how that would also, uh, increase in, in desire when the resolution goes higher and higher because you're getting a much more immersive view of that sports event and really being there. But uh, let's let's uh, go on to then maybe the next question to go something much more. Uh, uh, let me have a look. Um, so there's a question from Brian Edwards uh, regarding audio that NJ is an important aspect of UHD and uh, it's mandated in some regional standards. Uh, but service deployment is slow. Why do we think this is the case? And maybe we can cover the commercial questions first, followed by the technical one, because I'm sure they are both impacting. So Jason, give you anything to say on the NGA side about deployment? Yeah, I, I mean, so I can certainly give a Dolby perspective on, on this. Um, so I think we're, we're seeing an acceleration in the uh, in the platforms that are choosing to to put NGA uh, within their specifications, um, you know, so so you know, close to home, we've seen um, it included in specs in in Italy and and across Nordic. Um, we've seen it uh, included in the new draft French specification. Um, uh, we've seen it recently selected in Poland for the new DVB-T2 UHD platform in Poland. Um, so, so you know, I think there is a, uh, a an acceleration in the, in the number of specifications that are, are featuring at NGA. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but so I think the the uh, the dynamics of actually 
um, getting to uh, more and more uh, services on the air. So moving from the trials that we're seeing, you know, pretty regularly now to actually to actually getting services on the air is more driven by the dynamics of well, when a UHD service is launching on on terrestrial in in those in those markets. Um, you know, one of the one of the markets that is actively working very strongly uh, on uh, towards deployment uh, is in the US. Um, and interestingly, there's there's been some uh, some uh, very good consumer research work done in the US, uh, basically asking consumers, well, what uh, what features of next generation broadcast are meaningful to you? You know, is it um, you know is it high resolution images? Is it um, uh, immersive audio? Is it the ability to uh, hear hear the dialogue more clearly? Um, is it interactivity? Is it in car reception? Like, what what features are, are the most relevant to you? And and that consumer research has actually found pretty convincingly that one of the strongest, most desirable features when you look right the way across the audience groups uh, is clearer dialogue, the ability to actually follow the, the follow the program better, um, which is a key advantage that that NGA can bring. Um, and as a result of that, we're seeing. Uh, the industry really uh, align around that feature and, and how they can uh, get services on air uh, quickly the, 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 that have that feature. So I think from, you know, from the point of view of a technology provider, uh, the, the question that we're asking ourselves is how can we make it easier for broadcasters to launch services that have features like that? How can we make it easier for broadcasters to you know, launch services that have you know that have the, um, the the dialogue enhancement feature available without them having to go and remix content in some sort of new formats. You know if that can work for existing stereo or 5.1 content um, as well as any new content they produce, then uh, then that that would be great. So th so I think you know we 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 as, as as solution providers have to find find the ways of enabling some of these new benefits, some of the accessibility benefits, personalization benefits uh, in ways that um, actually don't require significant uh, investments in, uh, in new infrastructure and then allow that to happen over time. Okay, and Virginie, what is, has technology played a role at all in NGA adoption? Um, so I, th I think th there's a, a big difference between video and audio in, uh, um, in terms of codecs, which is that uh, in video, when you take a new codec, it's often to reduce the bitrate because the bitrate of the video is, is really the, the, most of the bitrate that you're using for a service. The bitrate of audio is less of an issue. So you don't need a necessarily a new audio codec to reduce that bitrate because that, that, that's not where you spend most of the bits, right? So in the case of NGA, we have mostly uh, taken it because of additional features um, like personalization, uh, more channels, um, as, as, as Jason mentioned. And I think in that case, it's really a, um, a matter of uh, maybe, maybe educating the people, uh, explaining um, what these new codecs can do, uh, which may not be so clear at the moment. And certainly bitrate saving is not the main driver for adoption of these audio codecs the way it is for video codecs. So that's a big difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, excellent. So uh, I, we only have a couple of questions left. I think, uh, are people still okay to carry on to answer these last few to get completely over the line? Excellent, excellent. So uh, I have a question here actually that talks more towards the business issues of Codex and it's a straightforward question from Benny Norling. Uh, are the IPR issues solved regarding HEVC or any other Codex to be honest? Uh, I'd like to maybe Jason or Virginie uh, to talk to that maybe. So it's a straightforward question, but uh, it's difficult to give a straightforward answer. Um, so, um, and, and, and certainly, I, you know, I, I, I can't comment in this environment on, um, on, uh, on, on IPR issues. Um, I, I would say that uh, one of our criteria for the, um, uh, for the introduction of new audio or video codecs within, within DVB 
um, is uh, is that uh, licensing of the technologies needs to be on a um, in a fair, reasonable, and non non discriminatory basis. Um, and it's on that basis that 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 HEPC was included within the, the DVB specification. Um, I think the only thing that I can point to is uh, there are clearly services in the market that are deploying using HEVC and there are clearly devices uh, deploying in the market that are capable of receiving those services um, in pretty significant numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Virginia, anything to add? Well, the problem of this question is that issues is different for different people, right? What does it mean? Does it mean that HEVC is too expensive? Does it mean that uh, there are three patent pools existing for HEVC? Does it mean things uh, are not clear enough, that the conditions are not clear enough? I, I don't know what it means exactly. Um, for different people, the issues will be different. So um, I guess there will always be issues depending on your... Uh, requirements, uh, how mu much money you have um, available. Um, so that, that's very yeah. difficult to answer this question. Yeah, well, maybe um, in my, my own professional career area in terms of being a consultant, uh, advising companies, uh, broadcasters, device manufacturers, platform operators regarding codex, etc. Um, I would say that pretty much all codex are afflicted in some way with some sort of IPR question. Each has its levels of risk, whether it's medium, low, high. Each has its cost, low, medium, high. Uh, each has its consequences of whatever you choose. Uh, it has their coverage and all the different device types. And uh, I think the key, key answer to sum up is IPR issues will never be resolved as long as we have IPR. Okay, uh, going there to the next question, a very in-depth technical question again from Ravi Saxena. Uh, people talk about 12-bit HDR. Do today's camera sensors support that dynamic range? And think, I think I should also add, do the displays support that range as well? And maybe we can address that to Virginie on a technology basis and then throw it out to anyone else to answer. So unfortunately, I'm not a camera expert. Uh, I'm not sure what camera can do. I believe it was possible uh, already at the beginning of HRD to, to have a 12 bits uh, signal. Um, now the question is, uh, do you want to send that at the moment in terms of DVB? At least we only have 10 bit uh, HRD on uh, on the on the delivery path, uh, but um, uh, I, I believe it's uh, it's uh, perfectly possible if you have a 12 bit signal to uh, uh, to convert it to 10 bit prior to delivery. But in terms of delivery, it's only 10 bits at the moment. Okay, well, I just to add from my own experience, there are cameras available that can operate at up to 16 bits, but that really then isn't the question about what it can digitally, how it can digitally represent the signal. And then it's really down to the sensitivity, dynamic range, noise characteristics, and other technical characteristics of the sensor as to really whether you actually get the, you can actually get a full one-to-one -one mapping of the of the 16 bits to actual picture change. So I think. Uh, it gets a little bit foggy, excuse the pun, as you get slight, as you go up in the bit rates in, in terms of the uh, pick, uh, the bit rates. Um, but maybe is there anyone else who wants to add anything? Yeah. To that question? Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll just put it in from the the, 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 the viewing point of view. So um, the research I'd seen done by some people in Hollywood was that 90% um, of the population can see the difference between 10 bit and 8 bit given suitable material. 10% um, can see the difference between 12-bit and 10-bit and even Hollywood's own golden eyes couldn't see any difference over 13-bit. Um, there are other reasons to put more bits in at the beginning as you say Ian um, and to give an example when I worked in a video processor chip uh, 15 years ago then we processed everything at 17-bit even though it was an 8-bit video environment to make sure we didn't lose things and black levels and so on were important. Um, so there may be other good reasons to capture it. In terms of delivery, you're, you're down into the vanishingly small part of the population um, yeah. can actually see it. And I think that that's probably a bigger question. At the moment, most LCD panels actually work on 8-bit and they then dither the panel and do various clever drive schemes to take it up to 10. So um, 
I think there's some question about what's actually happening. And most PC, vit, PC graphics is actually done in 6-bit um, with some dithering and fiddling around. Um, and people seem pretty comfortable with watching that stuff. Mm -hmm. So with the right content, I think these things can be seen. Most people don't watch static test cards. They watch programs. And I think other things are more important. Um, and in the end, you're going to have to turn around to people and say, we're going to need to pay for more satellite transponders um, if we're going to do this, to which the question, of course, is will the consumers pay more? Yes. Very clearly a business ask. Um, is that everything on that one? Because we've got uh, one, well, I've got two questions I want to cover now. One is from the audience and one final one I want to leave everyone with uh, about the perspective of UHD at, in the industry as a whole. So let's, let's cover the question from uh, Uray Alpha Game. Uh, do you agree when talking about HDR that HLG is better for live events because it's interoperability and background um, um, uh, uh, basically backwards compatibility and PQ is better for cinema and series because of quality? And that's a very loaded question. Would anyone like to take that one up? Virginie or Jason, maybe? Uh, so the, the only thing I could say is uh, certainly PQ was developed uh, with uh, mostly cinema in mind originally and HLG with mostly uh, live broadcast originally. Therefore, there, there is certainly um, uh, a design intent that is different uh, from the beginning. I think both technologies uh, have tried to address uh, the other world in the meantime, uh, but certainly uh, that's uh, that was the way the technologies were originally developed. Yeah. Anyone else like to add anything? It's just, yeah. Let me add. So, so I mean, I think the I think this is still an open question. Um, I don't think we've yet seen uh, where the industry will uh, will ultimately. Um, end up, um, you know, end up lying on this. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly. So, it's, you know, so let me declare an interest. So, so Dolby uh, was uh, was the organisation that did the research that um, that led to the, the standardisation of, of PQ. Um, and and certainly, I've seen a number of very compelling live demonstrations of um, of, of, uh, of, of live broadcast type content with PQ. Um, so I think the uh, I I I think that the story is not yet um, concluded on this one. Yeah, uh, just one final, final point. Sorry, go ahead. Ben. Yeah, final point from the UHD forums perspective. We've been screaming on the rooftops the say, a message for the last four to five years that um, of course there will be different use cases where one of the two might be more convenient and might make more sense. We're not saying they're identical by any means, but what we're saying is that it is no longer an excuse that it could have been. In 2016, early 2016, uh, to say, oh, I better wait to see what this story is between HLG and PQ or whatever, because now we know how to do it in the head end, we know how to do it in the network, we know how to do it in the devices to transform from one to the other. Again, I'm not saying they're identical, but I'm saying it's, it, you know, it's, there's, it's nothing to do with a format war or a problem like that. There will be times when one's better than the other, but it is never a technical problem. We can transform any which way between one and the other and back again. And we've, and the, as you, as you and I have demonstrated, and the consumer, NAB and, and the IBC many can times. And the consumer can watch it as well in whatever form. Generally, HLG and PQ is supported by most displays, vast majority of displays, except maybe some people may still have one of those pre-2016 ones. Um, but I would also like to add to that. I think there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a significance factor about what is impacting the quality of what people see. And I think there are two greater factors that impact the quality of what people see. One is the production of that content and the source for, source of what that content has been. And the second one is actually what the display actually quality is. Um, because at the end of the day, those dominate much more than any ability for someone for, for the actual formats to have slight differences in quality. And I'm not saying either one is different. They're just different. They're, they're not better. They're different. And they each have their uses. And that's from a, a, both a primarily a personal perspective from my technology work that I've done with, uh, delivery of UHD services and particularly HDR services over the last five years. So um, anyone else like to add to that? 
I'll just add, uh, Ian, I see, I see Simon Gaudler um, had added an interesting comment um, on there as well, um, which is basically to, you know, I think one area that we as an industry are learning a lot about is, is backwards compatibility. Um, yes. And actually, that has been, I think, one of the challenges of, of HDR is, is, is how do we achieve images um, that, uh, that are also going to be compatible when we present them in, in SDR. And uh, you know, I think that was one of the uh, one of the exciting promises of of, of HLG um, of, um, of of backwards compatibility. But I think even there, we're seeing that it, it's it's kind of more challenging to uh, to achieve the levels of compatibility that perhaps we 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 originally expected. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 as an industry continue to learn how we can how we can make sure that we can get the right kind of SDR images or standard dynamic range images as in parallel with with creating HDR. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, and um, Jason, that, sorry, and, that, and yeah, that, that's ahead, absolutely true. But let's remember that, you know, 4K TVs escaped into the wild uh, rather than anything more structured. And, and the content industry has been playing catch up to that huge surprise being sprung on it, you know, ever since. And I don't think that um, uh, I, I don't think that's anything that they could have been done about it. Um, that re just reflects the competitive pressure in consumer electronics hardware that people threw stuff out there without really thinking um, any more than th the fact that they could do it. Um, and, and in in the words from Jurassic Park, um, you were so busy wrapped up with what you doing stuff because you could. You never thought to think about what whether you should, uh, and and that you know reflects the reality of it. And I think that talks to the creation of the Ultra HD forum back in 2015. That we saw this new technology, and we went, guys, this has got to be product productized. It's got to be usable end to end, from glass to glass, and we have to address everything. Um, I would like actually to go to one last question, and this is actually related to where we are today with regard to UHD services and where we think, whether we are thinking of succeeding or failing or somewhere in between. Um, the HD era really started in the 2005-6 era with the big, first big event being the, the World Cup in Germany in 2006. And we started to have linear services delivered then. We didn't have catch-up services in that sort of realm because they weren't in existence yet. You know, Netflix was still delivering things on bits of plastic. Um, so we had the, the launch of HD then and it had a growth flow that really linear commercial channels started to come through in 2008, 9, 10, but really only really started to hit prime time in 2011 stroke 12 in terms of pretty much every platform in the world having at least one real working channel rather than a demo channel. Um, and that really was a six year period. Where do you guys see UHD today in that? In, that, in the equivalence towards HD. And obviously we also have to talk to the fact that the HD drivers were also about flat screens, not necessarily about resolution. And today, you know, we've got different drivers. So maybe we can go around each and probably the, the starting point maybe would be Paul to get in there straight off. <laughs> your your anal anal analyst view of where we are with UHD. I, I think that we're, we're still uh, to go back to the HD one, we're, we're still in about 2004. So the big showcase event hasn't yet happened. Okay, it, it should have happened this year. It, it now isn't. Um, and we're going to have an amazing rush of um, Euro, Euro Cup, Olympics, and then within uh, just over a year, the World Cup. So I think we've got 18 months from, say, June next year, which are going to be absolutely crazy in terms of live events. So t 2021 is the new 2006. So we're that, not there yet. That's um, interesting because we've got over 149 services out there rather than the yeah. one we had in 2005. But, uh, <laughs> and that, that, but it's, the, it's, the compelling, it's the compelling single event that I think drives it. And, and that is that it, the one to hang it all on. You know, so my my view for this year was that everybody was going to hand things on the Olympics and public service broadcasters across Europe would say, ha ha, you know, this is the moment. Um, and, and okay, the moment turns out to be next year now. Um, but, but that, that gives everybody time to, uh, to, to, to 
work on perfecting it. Okay, Jason. Right. Sorry, uh, I, Ben, I'll keep you to last because you're the one okay. with the tracker. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so I think Paul has, has, has summed it up nicely. I mean, I think we have quite a year next year shaping up. Um, and if you, you know, couple the density of major events that is happening times the hunger of people to, you know, actually go out and have some fun and, you know, enjoy this stuff as a collective experience, then, uh, then, you know, I think it, that, that all adds up to being a, 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 sig a significant opportunity. Um, and I think, uh, I, you know, I think what, um, you know, what, what we will see that is perhaps different from the HD era um, is, well, you know, first of all, let's bear in mind we're, we're in a situation where these, the end devices are rapidly deploying, um, you know, driven just by the dynamics of, of the consumer business. Um, so so the, the, the receiving devices are there. Um, and uh, secondly, we have the added dynamic of broadband delivery too. And I think it's gonna be really exciting to see over the next few years, how you know, broadcasters and other content providers make use of that opportunity to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to you know, scale up more innovative services and perhaps be able to launch things more speculatively um, or driven by smaller milestones than traditionally these kind of big tentpole sports events that we've, we've, we had, we've had to do. So I think, I think next year is gonna be really, uh, really important, um, but I think we'll also see a very interesting kind of background level of people being able to launch smaller or more experimental, or more innovative services um, based on the new capabilities that broadband delivery will, you know, is providing and will provide. Okay, Virgin, anything to add? Um, well, the, the thing I could add from a DVB point of view is uh, the standards are there. Uh, so in terms of standardization, the work's finished and uh, it's just for the market and the actors, the services to take these standards and make something out of them. Um, of course, in terms of what's going to happen, it's very difficult to say at the moment, right? Well, we live in, a, in an unprecedented situation. We have uh, the luck compared to many people in this world to... Um, work in the industry of entertainment and communication, which becomes even more important at the moment. Um, whether it's going to help or hinder UHD is the question because UHD needs, of course, more bitrate. And with um, many people working from home right now, bitrate is starting uh, to be a scarce resource or bandwidth is starting to be a scarce resource. So I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, certainly, um, I think for us as DVB, it's important that the technologies, the standards are there to offer a basis for uh, any, uh, any new ideas and any new services. Okay. And Ben, the last thought regarding well, the development of UHD? Yeah, I, I certainly agree with Paul that we are in a very protracted 2006, to go back to your analogy. On, on HD. How protracted, we don't know yet. Uh, just a quick thought on, on, on the double-edged, it can go either way. This, you know, If variations of lockdowns and people staying more at home extend over the next, who knows, some people even say a couple of years. I think that's unlikely, but it's possible. There is also a driving thing, because as Paul rightly said, TV in general resists uh, downturns in the economy. But the whole idea of an immersive, exciting experience delivered at home through the TV is something that may be much more important to you if you're stuck at home a lot more. So, so there, there's positive things. But I'd just like to finish with a closing thought that when we started this whole enterprise, obviously there were no services when we launched. But when we started tracking them, they were in the low tens. We are now in the low hundreds we're moving up or we're still be closer to 200 and if you just think as donald trump only just discovered a few months ago there are about 200 countries in the world um we're almost at 200 services um we're getting to a point most of them are tier one services that we get there there's probably about four five hundred tier one services in the world uh so so it's just undeniable now market penetration 
again, this is called specialty. Something is considered to have penetrated a market when it's got about 30% of a market. That's, that's what, what you kind of learn in marketing schools. We're not quite there yet. If you think of 150 to reach maybe 500 or something total, we're not quite at 30%. We're almost there. So I really do believe we are in 2006. We're in January of 2006, except this year may have, may have 18 months to it or may have 24 months to this year. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, um, thanks very much. That's uh, gone through pretty much all the questions we want to answer right here and now. Um, uh, unless there's actually any any additional things to add, right. uh, I'd like to hand over to Johan. Thank you, Ian. And I want to say thank you to uh, all of our panelists and especially to the Ultra HD Forum who uh, initially approached DVB with this wonderful suggestion that we have this webinar. It's been a great discussion uh, teed up by some excellent presentations. So on behalf of the, uh, the DVB project office, I certainly want to thank uh, Ben and Thierry Fautier and Ian from the Ultra HD Forum. Also to thank uh, Virginie and Jason uh, from our CM and TMAVC groups for uh, stepping in and to thank Paul Gray and uh, his colleagues at Omdia for sharing their data with us. So the slides are available on the website now and uh, the video will be there later today. And with that said, I'm going to wish you all bon appétit. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Merci. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. I'll say goodbye then and I'll speak later maybe.